Today, we're pleased to introduce you to a drummer, singer, and composer who has been a member of such successful groups as Pilot and 10CC, Stuart Tosh. Stuart's recordings include hits such as these from the 1970s. <laughs> Very warm welcome, Stuart, and sincere thanks for taking some of your valuable time today to share some of your experiences with us. Let's start at the very beginning, Stuart, as the song says, a very good place to start. Born in Aberdeen on the northeast coast of Scotland, did you come from a family with a history of making music? I wouldn't say a family of making music. Uh, my father uh, played a little bit of piano, and my brother certainly did. He's been in a covers band for many years. But the fact was that my father worked for EMI, or HMV as it was known in those days, and as a result, we got lots of records, anything that EMI and all the labels under that particular umbrella, every, every label recording, he got a, a sample um, album or EP or single. So I was exposed to lots of different kinds of music through the 50s and into the 60s when um, you know, rock and roll was really taking off. So I went through big band, um, Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald, uh, Nat King Cole, Louis Armstrong, into trad jazz, skiffle, uh, into pop and rock throughout the 60s. So it was an incredible. Um, I didn't realize at the time how privileged I was to, to get all this and actually receiving records before any DJ or record shop got them. So um, Fantastic. I was... Um, uh, often running, as it were, with, with music in my head uh, very, very early on. How did you start what turned out to be a very successful professional musical career? Well, moving on from playing in bands in Edinburgh, in fact, that's how Pilot got together. I was depping for a drummer uh, at this band, had a residency in a big dance hall in Edinburgh. David Payton was the bass player and Ian Bernson uh, was the guitarist in the band. And David liked what I was playing and invited me down to a recording studio in Edinburgh where Billy Lyle was the, the studio engineer. The studio itself was doing Scottish repertoire which was uh, accordion music and I think the, the outside broadcast with pipe bands uh, but the room itself of the studio was wonderful for rock and roll and the music we were doing so we did all our demos there and Magic was one of them and once I heard that song I knew it was going to be successful. So we all trooped down to EMI in London and when they heard Magic, uh, I think they agreed uh, that it was going to be successful and we were assigned to EMI. So that was uh, that was it. The thrill was going into Abbey Road Studios in, in London and into particular Studio 2 where the Beatles and various famous people have recorded their uh, legendary music, um, just a thrill to do that. Brilliant. Ian Bernson actually didn't join the band to after we'd recorded Magic, so the guitar playing you're hearing uh, is all done by David, multi-talented chap he is. Let's hear that first single that is still so very popular and get some more of airplay here, Magic. <laughs>
find a way, hey, never seen a day break, leaning on my pillow in the morning, lazy day in bed, music in my head, crazy music playing in the morning. talking with a member of that very group, Stuart Tosh. Stuart, my research found that not only does that song continue to be requested, but it has also been recorded by many other artists. When a group has such a successful song that the public want to hear again and again, do you feel artists ever get to the point of thinking, oh no, not again, especially when on tour? Oh, not at all, Mike. Uh, I've always enjoyed playing Magic and very grateful for the success it's given the band. It has indeed been covered by a lot of people and it's been used uh, extensively in, in the States and probably elsewhere for advertising and in a few movies. Uh, so very delighted that, uh, you know, that the song has stood the test of time. As they say, a good song is a good song. It has uh, stood that test, certainly. The group's next hit single reinforced its position as a top recording band as January not only got to the top of the UK charts but also had fabulous success here in Australia. It was actually number two in the best-selling singles list here in 1975, ahead of ABBA. Perhaps you'll tell us a little about the song and, in retrospect, if the group should have had a tour of the country at that time. Yeah, January... What a good song. Uh, David had this idea, that the first phrase, da-da-da-da, and he didn't know what to put there. So January it lent itself to to filling that uh, particular uh, moment, and it became a, a girl's name, really. Uh, yes, it, it, it was very successful uh, in the UK number one for uh, three weeks, and... Of course, in Australia, absolutely incredible. We were thrilled that it, it stayed uh, so popular for such a long period of time there. And we have great regret that we never toured there as a band. Uh, perhaps the management weren't as uh, good as they should have been in that respect. But we did tour individually in terms of me playing with Tensy C down there on a couple of tours and David uh, with Elton John. So we had the chance to... Uh, enjoy being in Australia. Uh, we both had a, a wonderful time there. 
Although Pilot continued to release a large number of good singles and albums, the band never had the success of Magic and January again. Looking back, why was this possibly the case? A uh, difficult one, that. Um, yeah, still released a lot of uh, material. Perhaps there was a bit of similarity in the follow-ups. But by this time, we were, we were doing uh, different things uh, individually. Uh, you know, I was doing lots of session work and uh, it kind of drifted apart and I, I just I left the band in uh, 76 uh, so yes it's it's just it never uh, continued sadly but uh, very grateful that the band did have that success with with two uh, singles uh, at that particular time in 1977, Stuart, you moved from Pilot and joined the immensely popular group 10CC, who had already had a huge number of top 10 hits. What stresses are there on a professional performer as yourself when he or she leaves one successful band and joins another? Ah, I don't think it was stressful. It was a delight, actually. I was so glad and very uh, pleased that I got the job with 10CC. I'd been a fan for many years. So I thought the music was very... Very clever, uh, very interesting to listen to. So delighted to, to be part of that band. Shortly after joining 10CC, the band recorded the album Bloody Taurus, their sixth album, and the second after Lol Cream and Kevin Godley had left. The album was particularly important as it gave the group another number one hit song, Dreadlock Holiday, as well as containing a song composed and sung by yourself, Reds In My Bed. How did you feel moving from the rear of the band as a drummer singer into the front spotlight as the lead singer when you performed your song? Absolutely petrified. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly I was standing out front trying to play a guitar. Um, the track was released as a single in, in the States. Uh, it didn't really go anywhere, I'm afraid, but uh, I had the uh, dubious uh, delight of doing a, a video for it in, in Hollywood. Oh dear. Anyway, yes, it was um, an interesting experience, uh, that uh, singing out front, uh, albeit just for one of the tours. But uh, yes, it was, uh, uh, my safety net is, is a drum kit in front of me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yes, it was interesting singing out front for a change. Let's now hear you and your composition, Reds in My Bed.
Reds in my bed, composed by our guest today, Stuart Tosh, with Stuart as the lead singer there with 10cc. What was your inspiration for the song, Stuart? Yeah, that was uh, the result of watching a documentary on television uh, about the Berlin Wall and the desperation of people trying to escape from communism from the East getting through the West. Um, Had a bit of an effect on me, really, watching it. It was quite... uh, Incredible the lengths people went to. In fact, there was a person that was moulded into the wing of a car and <clears throat> got through that way. Uh, I think that there's footage that most people have seen of people cutting the wire and getting through and, uh, it was, you know, desperate times. And in fact, when I was with 10CC, we, we went through the, the wall before it came down and looked at the tourists' heads above the wall on the west, us being in the east. Um, <laughs> there was nothing within a mile in the east. Nobody was allowed to live there. The tram cars going up and down, and we were taken round, shown various areas, some beautiful buildings which are obviously now open to the public. That were very grand uh, courtyards. You can imagine horses and carriages gliding in to the these huge houses. The bullet and shrapnel marks still existed on the walls from the Second World War. Yes, it was um, it was very humbling experience being there, but thank goodness that uh, doesn't exist now, well, at least in Europe. Let's move away from the songs themselves for a bit and look at performances. I'm aware that before live gigs, a great deal of time and effort is put into doing sound checks. What's the purpose of these, Stuart, and, and how important are they? Well, a sound check is uh, getting the sound in the hall, the auditorium, uh, clear uh, for every instrument to be heard by the audience. And every hall has a different acoustic quality. So what the procedure would be, uh, set drums up and start playing uh, from the bass drum, uh, snare drum, hi-hat, through the toms, cymbals. And once that sound is up, uh, Eric Stewart, who's a studio engineer, and uh, helped uh, with the sound when we're playing live, we used to walk around the auditorium while you're playing. And a drum kit really has just about every frequency from the high-end cymbals uh, right down through the toms and snare drum down to the bass drum. So he would um, walk around and put his arms up and indicate where the road crew may change or add to the PA system out front. So everything was absolutely crystal clear. And the band did have a, a reputation of, of having a very good sound quality in, in the hall itself. In previous conversations with you, I understand there can be a downside to getting a top-notch uh, sound for a live performance in that some have felt that the band had been miming to a pre-recorded track. Yes, uh, as I said, the, the band reputation for a very good PA system where every uh, uh, so- <coughs> sound or, or frequency could be heard. I remember playing a triangle uh, in the percussion section thinking this is never going to cut through against uh, guitars and keyboards. But uh, somebody at the end said, wow, that uh, triangle you played really cut through, amazing. So I thought, 
crikey. So everything was very audible out front, so much so that people uh, cynical, cynically thought we were miming. So on one of the tours, as a backdrop, we had a huge reel-to-reel -reel tape revolving during the, the act, as it were, to thumb our nose to the people that thought we were miming. And we weren't. <laughs> we absolutely were not. Everything was, was totally live, uh, perhaps with, with one exception. How about what to me sounds like a complex song with background vocals and music, like the brilliant song I'm Not In Love. Does a live performance of such a song have to have uh, pre-recorded inputs? Uh, yes, well, that one did. Uh, we had a tape with the backing vocals on, uh, but we sang along with it, so it wasn't totally mimed. Uh, and the only other tape we used uh, from memory was the opening of A Mandy Fly Me, which was a, a tape. Other than that, everything was totally live. Let's hear that beautiful and very popular song that got to the very top of the UK charts in 1975 and to number six here in the Perth charts. And I have to add that it is one of my very personal favourites too. Just a silly phase I'm going through And just because I call you up Don't get me wrong Don't think you got it made I'm not in love No, no
I know the original recording was made before you joined 10CC, but I believe it is documented who whispered the words, Big Boys Don't Cry. Ah, yes. Uh, I was told it was a secretary who worked at uh, Strawberry Studios North, which is in Stockport. Uh, Eric and Graham had a studio south called Strawberry South down in Dorking in Surrey. Yes, that's the, the story I got, was they just got the secretary in to, to whisper, big boys don't cry. And uh, I guess that, that that's your answer to that question. <laughs> While we're talking about the song I'm Not In Love, I believe the choir was made up of countless re-recordings on loops of tape with the band members, well before the days of computer editing and sampling. Yeah, actually, I was told that uh, the track I'm Not In Love had been recorded a year before, uh, and it was a different format. The, the feel they had was a bossa nova, which I guess lends itself to that feel. Uh, anyway, they thought, oh, crikey, it sounds like a, a lounge band in a hotel. So <laughs> it was shelved. However, they realised a year later, uh, 76, that uh, it was too good a, a song to, to not do, to not uh, just to leave alone. So uh, a low cream came up with the, the idea of having a, a wash of uh, vocals in the background. And you're right, it, it was it took a long time to, to do this. And what the band did was they went out and they all sang one note, uh, as long as they could hold a breath. And uh, perhaps your listeners are, are familiar with a, a recording desk where you have faders on the, on the desk, about 24 of them or 48 nowadays or even more. And each one of those is a, is, a, is a volume control, it's a boost for volume. And you push it up and down and the volume increases and diminishes. And so they recorded uh, on a chromatic scale on a piano, which is kind of and so on. So each one of those notes was recorded, uh, as I say, by the four guys. And it must have taken quite a while. But once it was done, they played the fader, faders on the desk like they would a piano. So they push up and you get chords. And that's how the, uh, the backing came for uh, I'm Not In Love. Uh, Fantastic. And it has been used uh, since. I think we were, we were on a tour in America and we were playing Phoenix, Arizona. And I remember after the show, we uh, in the dressing room, there was a knock on the door and I opened the door and there was Billy Joel standing there and he came to not apologize, but say, well, I, I kind of used your track on uh, his big hit uh, uh, covered by Barry White. Uh, Don't go changing, try and please me. That that one. And so, yeah, it's um, it's it's had a, a life of its own as well. But I, I'm not in love. Huge uh, success for 10CC uh, and still is played, as you say. Hey, what about those three songs such as It Doesn't Matter At All? Feel the love and for you and I. So let's all take a listen to those few songs that you sorely missed. I can't yell at my mother. It wouldn't do any good because she wouldn't listen. I'm just going to have to prove myself for the next 10 years. If she's anything like my grandmother, I know it's going to take the next 50 years. But it was a good dinner, wasn't it? Kathy. You know, when we get our own house, I want to have a barbecue, and yeah. then we can invite the whole neighborhood. What? I got my orders. No. Ten days. Loosen up. You don't want to spoil the time until I go, do you? Kathy, I'm not doing this because I want to. And you're not making it any easier for Who me. You said I had to make it easy. Well, I don't want you to go. Nothing is going to happen to me. Promise. Promise.
no business to talk They got no reason at all I'll take a chance with you, baby It doesn't matter at all It doesn't matter at all It doesn't matter at all Yes. <laughs> Would you call my mother this morning? I want to set up a dinner before I leave. Let's not talk about it. Not this morning. Kathy, we have to be realistic. No, we don't. You do, maybe, but not me. Kathy, I'm leaving in a couple of days. Don't you know what shh means? Could you do me a favor? Pack in private. Have it your way. Yeah, I'll have some bacon. I was afraid you'd say that. But you don't have time. Do I want cold cereal? Yes, you do. <laughs> Great. Just like Mother used to open. Um, I'm sorry, what did you say? I said you look like you've just seen a ghost. It wouldn't surprise me. Geraldine said there are ghosts all over this house. <laughs> no, I wouldn't be uh, surprised a bit. Where have you been, love? I went out for a drink with a, a girlfriend. Why didn't you invite Geraldine? I was told that she had been here. Oh, yeah. I asked her if she wanted to come, but she said that she didn't want to. Do you have a good visit? What? With your friend. Oh. Oh, yeah. We had a lot to talk about. We haven't seen each other in years. So you had quite a bit to catch up on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And things like your favorite fudge recipe and the latest embroidery stitches, things like that? <laughs> no. We talked about the men in our lives. 
Is that what took you so long? Yeah. But it was nice, you know. I, I haven't talked to her for a long time. And who's the man in her life? Her husband. Just like my husband is the man in my life. And what did you tell her about the man in your life? I told her all about you. I told her about the wedding and I told her about the honeymoon and about how wonderful you are. I don't know if I like the idea of you talking about me to other people. I don't know if I like the idea of other people knowing my business. We didn't talk about your business. I told her how wonderful and generous and attractive you are.
Crocker. Frankie Crocker here. We're going to have some great things for you today. This is VH1 Video Hits 1, the one that's on all day, every day. Good evening, everyone. I'm Frankie Crocker, and welcome to New Visions from VH1. As always, we'll be dedicating the next two hours to the musical visions of today's leading progressive artists. We'll run the gamut from the melodic jazz saxophone playing of George Howard to the intensity of Philip Glass and the time travel experiments of Mannheim Steamroller. And we'll also sample the latest from innovators like Kate Bush, Timothy Donahue, and Leo Kotke. Now, despite these artists' differing styles, this is music from the heart, and we're delighted to share it with you. So, let's get started with Lee Rittenauer's international worldview, Earth Run, on new visions from VH1. Enjoy. You seem to have made a remarkable recovery. Earlier today, you were in the throes of a very nasty virus. Yes, well, a couple of hours in bed with you. You have the magic cure. <laughs> Only we should thought of a different arrangement. I mean, I don't mind being with another man's wife, but to be in that man's very own bed is a bit awkward, you know. That's funny. You haven't acted like it bothered you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was perfect. I suppose you would. What do you mean by that? I mean, a lot of women uh, like uh, the excitement of all the sneaking around in their affairs. That is why I thought... Uh, me being here would give you quite a thrill. <laughs> I'm not lying here to be psycho and <laughs> The world is full of other people. Ooh, take a look around. We're quick to laugh when they've got troubles. And we'll put them down We go We're not so hard You know It's like a roller coaster On a downward motion On a one-way street We can't control our feet We're on the road to ruin Don't know what we're doing She may be quiet She may be shy is wrong. Oh, no, she'll be all right. It's just nerves. She'll be fine in a minute. It's not just nerves. I'm getting sick. I'm dizzy. I'm having dizzy spells. What? Well, you can't have dizzy spells in that dress. It's just been pressed. 
Besides, we can't cancel now. What would I do with all those guests? We have to give them some entertainment. Well, uh, tell them it's a housewarming party. I don't know. Tell them anything. No, Raven, please. It's just as April says. You're just nervous. Now, look. Here's something that will make you feel better. It's from Skylar. party. I'll tell you, Geraldine, Whitney Saxon, <laughs> sure knows how to give a party. When she does it, she does it right. It's a wonderful group, yeah? Yes. All except for two. <sighs> I, do I detect someone becoming Raven again? <laughs> okay, all right. What do you <laughs> well, I don't mean you. Um, <clears throat> Martine Duval is still here, isn't she? Yes, and she's enchanting all the eligible males, and even some that aren't very eligible. April, I wouldn't like you to be so irritating, darling. <laughs> Not when you deserve it, darling. <laughs> Moving back to the time you were with 10CC and the album Bloody Tourist, Stuart, what is the history of the track of Dreadlock Holiday that became a number one hit in the UK in 1978 and in Perth was in the charts for 20 weeks, including two weeks at number two? Strange how songs come about. Uh, Dreadlock Holiday was based on experiences by Eric Stewart uh, being on holiday with Justin Hayward of uh, the Moody Blues and uh, Graham Goulburn being on holiday in Jamaica and uh, the Caribbean islands and just picking up conversations that people would say there. Uh, the classic is speaking about cricket. Uh, the guy said, cricket, man, I don't like it. I love it. So, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> little statements like that kind of stick. And they, they just uh, made a note of uh, all the things they'd heard there. And uh, that's how that song came about. Thanks, Stuart. And here is the song, Dreadlock Holiday. I was walking down the street Concentrating on truck and right I heard a dark voice beside of me And I looked round in a state of fright I saw four faces, one man A brother from the gutter They looked me up and down a bit And turned to each other Some respect 
said, I'll give you one dollar. I said, you got to be joking, man. It was a present from my mother. He said, I like it, I want it, I'll take it off your hands and you'll be sorry. You cross me, you better understand that you're alone. from 10cc we're talking today with Stuart Tosh a member of two top bands Pilot and 10cc not so much of a holiday for you I guess Stuart as you taught Eastern Australia in 1983 after having been here in Perth with the band in 1977 America and Canada and in 1995 Europe and Japan what sort of stresses do such intense tours put onto a professional performer? I guess you just have to keep yourself um, fit and well to perform. The whole thing is about the two and a half hours you're on stage at night. The rest of it does become a bit tedious, although it sounds pretty glamorous. When you're doing Canada and the States, as we did, uh, you're flying every day to a different town, uh, across from east to west in Canada and then into the States down the west coast through the Midwest up the east uh, coast and we finished back in Canada and that was six weeks of, of literally every day flying to a different state, different town, different venue so it's a case of look after yourself, try and get as much rest as you can um, the crucial thing is you don't lose your voice and rest is the, the thing for that really sleep as much as possible. Yes, it it, it, <laughs> it becomes where Saturdays are, are Wednesdays and Tuesdays are, you know, Fridays. You get disorientated a bit. I recall the, the tour uh, schedule I kept by the side of my bed and it was like a telephone directory. <laughs> it was that, <laughs> that so many venues in it. Uh, yeah, you just keep going. You become a bit of a zombie. But as I say, you live for the two hours or so at night to perform. That's what it's all about. Is it just possible then that the stresses of touring and performing cause some of the difficulties between members of bands that get publicly known? Yeah, you hear of bands uh, breaking up uh, through squabbles and what have you. But, I mean, when I was touring with 10CC, okay, it was pretty gruelling. But do you have a whole entourage of people to 
smooth things out, you know, in advance, great road crew and, uh, you know, catering people. So, you know, generally we we're, were, we had a great sense of humor within the band and we got along pretty well together. So we, uh, there was never really any huge tiffs that I can remember ever happening with the band. Perhaps we we're very fortunate in that respect. After your time with 10CC, you continued to perform in a whole variety of shows, including The Roy Orbison Story and Elvis the Musical. Tell us a little about these shows and what differences there were for you being part of an on-stage musical rather than a band. Well, how getting into theatre, uh, playing in theatre came about was uh, Rick Fenn of 10CC and a guy called Pete Howarth, who was one of Cliff Richard's backing vocalists and now the lead singer with the Hollies. Uh, together they wrote a musical for the theatre impresario Bill Kenwright. Fantastic. Uh, and it was based on the, the story of Robin Hood. And once I heard what they'd done, I thought it was very clever, very cleverly put together. The whole thing was music. There was no narration. And it was good music to play for their first attempt. Really good stuff. Uh, and I don't even think I have a sample of it anywhere. But uh, I said to Rick, I said, crikey, you know, um, I quite fancy being in a pit band. And uh, lo and behold, I got the gig. Uh, Cliff Richards' musical director, Alan Park, was on keyboards and he lives in Australia, uh, as does Rick Fenn, in fact. So, uh, very good little pit band. Uh, the show wasn't hugely successful, but I think the, uh, the pat on the back the band got was the press on the review said it was the best pit band in the West End in London. So that was very gratifying. Uh, from there, I, I went on to, to work for Bill for many years. Uh, the Royal Wilson story, uh, which I did for about eight years. That was uh, good fun. And some great songs Roy Orbison wrote. It really were. Uh, most of them starting just with a single voice and guitar and building to a big crescendo at the end and what a unique voice that man had, fantastic. Uh, moving from there to Elvis musical which was uh, a bit of a challenge. 90 songs per show, eight, eight shows in six days, uh, three different Elvi, the young uh, the middle guy that did the 68 comeback for American television and our Las Vegas Elvis at the end. Uh, again, no narration, totally uh, music from start to finish. So that was, um, as I say, uh, quite interesting. Uh, Bill actually got me out trying to act in the Orbis Orbison show, which scared the pants off me. Uh, <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, <laughs> a fun experience. Uh, yes, I, I, I did theatre, but 12 or more years uh, with various various shows. Um, all, all good fun, really. Uh, quite hard work, but uh, very rewarding. Moving back now to your time at 10CC, there seem to have been times where the group had no recording schedule or touring commitment. During these periods, I understand you toured with other artists such as Sir Cliff Richard and were also part of recording of albums with singers such as Roger Daltrey. How difficult is it for a professional musician to adapt to the musical styles of other artists? Well, unfortunately, Eric Stewart had a, a pretty serious car accident and there was a time out uh, while he was recovering. So I did get involved working with various other artists. Um, I think when you, you record with other people, uh, the, the tracks that they want you to record, Essentially, most of them are in demo form, so you have an idea of what, what you, you have to play. Or, or the, the artist will have a, an idea that he wants the, the band to, to perform, and, and you try various things out. Some songs take a while to record, some uh, you do it in, in just a handful of takes. Uh, and I think you just have to be sympathetic to what, what you're hearing and have a good set of ears. Um, uh, to, to, to play the, the piece the way the artist wants it to be played um, and hopefully you get it right. Uh, uh, so uh, enjoyable doing doing uh, both Roger and I did a, a, an album with Cliff and, and a tour with him. Uh, amazing following the man has, Cliff Richard, it's incredible. He still sells out everywhere he goes in the UK. It's um, 
He's had a, an amazing career. Yeah, it was very enjoyable. Uh, I think the scary thing is doing session work more than uh, anything else because you don't know what's uh, waiting for you at the studio. Uh, there have been some scary moments, but uh, I've managed to, to get through them all. <laughs> now, as with all the other artists and performers I have spoken with, Stuart, I leave the hardest question to the end. With all the compositions that you have played on, either on stage or in the recording studio, I'd like you to select a personal favourite to play us out today, perhaps telling us why you chose it. Ooh, that's a tough one. Uh, well, I suppose it has to be January uh, with Pilot, because it was the first number one the band had. Uh, and it's, you know, just uh, euphoria at the time. And of course, privilege of playing on a number number one with... Uh, another number one, I should say, with 10CC, Red Lot Holiday, uh, both good tracks. I guess it's got to be January by Pilot. That would be my choice. Thank you so very much for all the time you spent in answering my questions today, Stuart. And on behalf of all the listeners that love the music you've given us over the years, may I thank you for that too. Could we wish you continued success with that the little white ball on the greens of Spain? Well, many thanks to you, Mike. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Um, uh, yes, it's uh, it's been a while since I've done any interviews, to be honest. It's very kind, very kind of you to invite me along. Uh, yes, uh, I do play a bit of golf. It's more uh, plow the fields and scatter, but uh, the sun does shine uh, here, although it isn't today, I have to say, but we know it's going to get better. Anyway, th many thanks again for, for having me along, Mike, and... Uh, all the best to you and, every, and all your listeners. Bye-bye for now. Thanks, Stuart. Ladies and gentlemen, the music of drummer Stuart Tosh of Pilot and 10CC. <laughs> Like a f-